The following is a presentation from the MJ Cast, the internet's premier podcast on all things Michael Jackson. I'm a Black American. I am proud of who I am. Together, we can make a change in the world. I want to see you. <laughs> I like to take sounds and put them on the microscope. There's a driving bass. You become the bass. Let the music write itself. I don't sing it if I don't mean it. Welcome to the MJ Cast, your source of news, discussion, and interviews on the King of Pop. Hello, and welcome to episode 141 of the MJ Cast, season eight. So excited to be here with Charlie Thompson, Charlie Carter, and of course, the wonderful ladies, cousins Courtney and Cam from the Janet Jackson podcast, Janet Today. We are so excited to be here all together to talk about Janet Jackson's new four-part Lifetime documentary. It's been a long time in the works. It is a personal look at Janet's world. It's got lots to say about her relationship with her brother Michael, her music, her impact on the entertainment industry, and we are all going to dig into it right now as a group. Let's do it. Let's start with Courtney and Cam. How are you guys doing? Great. All good. All good. We ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we thank you for coming on. It's it's always a pleasure to have you guys on, on the MJ cast. And I mean, you guys have just come off, off the back of a pretty exciting couple of months in, in Janet land, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. We, we've been kind of overwhelmed with the, the amount of uh, Janet news and, and just the general public's reaction. It seems like she's definitely having a renaissance. She was always in our hearts, but now she seems to be having a renaissance in the public eye. And so we're enjoying that very much. Yeah, we're here yeah. for it. <laughs> Yeah, and and so are we. There's some really cool stuff happening at the moment. I was I was looking online last night on social media and saw that she's announced some more concert dates coming up. I think there was some uh, Cincinnati concert date, and it's pretty pretty cool what's going on. We got some more stuff coming from Janet, which is great. Absolutely, I do think that the Cincinnati date was one that was rescheduled from last year, um, oh. but I believe. Yeah, it was canceled, not last year, 2020. Yeah, but Essence Fest is is a new announcement, and so we're yeah. super excited about that. And she's doing one of the big nights, which is that Saturday night. So that's big. When is that new album coming? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when it happened was. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hopefully soon, because I was watching a clip of her on Jimmy Fallon last night, and it was from way back, and she was talking about Black Diamond coming out. So <laughs> hopefully it's uh, not too far away. <laughs> yeah, we hope she's in the lab cooking, cooking up something special. So we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, uh, we are here with uh, MJ Cast co-hosts, uh, the two Charlies, Charlie Carter and Charlie Thompson. Fellas, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Hope you guys are very well and looking forward to season eight. Absolutely. Thank you for all the hardcore editing you're about to do on the season. You're very welcome, I think. <laughs> and uh, CT, Charlie Thompson, how are you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm all right. You, everybody well? We're good. Recording a little bit earlier for you than normal. It's not like midnight like usual. No, nice and early. 8.43 p.m. Nice. If we can get this polished off by 10.43, then I'll send you a present. <laughs> What's uh, What have you got planned exactly? You've been telling me we've got to wrap this up in two hours since yesterday. What's What's going on? I just want to go to bed. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's get into it. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the Janet Jackson documentary that came out a little while back. I think uh, probably about a month ago at this point. It uh, premiered on January twenty eighth and ran from January twenty eighth to January twenty ninth. Uh, Lifetime and A and E production and made up of four forty five minute parts. And this is something that Q and I reported on way back when on the MJ Cast. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, but it's been in the works for a while and the community knows it's been coming for a while. And really the idea is that I think it would have been, I can't remember exactly the year, um, Courtney and Cam, you'll be able to help me out, but at some point in the recent history, Janet started to be followed around by a documentary crew. Was it 2015 or is that still a bit early? Yeah, I do think it was 2015 or 2016 when this project started. It was originally, I guess, the main focus was she was going to do a tour documentary. Um, mm. So the, this group was hired to follow her and make essentially a, a tour documentary of the State of the World tour. Yeah. 
And, you know, it's something we've been talking about in the community for quite a while and looking forward to because Janet, as we know, like many members of the Jackson family, is quite guarded, I guess, around their personal life. So it was always very, like, exciting to kind of learn about what's going on behind the scenes. I guess the closest look we had into her world was probably her book, True You, which I got when it came out and loved reading that. And here's an opportunity for us to experience Janet even more closely. In the Michael community, I guess probably we weren't talking about it as much until uh, just prior to when it came out, when it started, you know, trailers started to drop. Courtney and Cam, in the Janet world, was this a hot topic going back a ways or... In the Janet community, I think that there was some skepticism. I'll let Cam jump in. But I think on my part, honestly, I was in the camp of like, I'll believe it when we see it. And I think we saw the first trailer in like November. And even it was kind of esoteric. It was that 30 second trailer bit. And it was a little esoteric. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't know what this is going to be. Yeah, I think just the, the when they first released the trailer about the documentary, it was like, oh, finally, you know, we've been hearing rumors about her doing a documentary. And to finally see that, you know, it's going to come to light was exciting for me. And then to see the trailers at one point, uh, it was like an inside joke between me and my cousin, like, when is it coming out? So when they released the dates and the promos and was pushing it, I think the excitement just started building and building amongst the community. And to me, honestly, I think she gave us a more glimpse than most people thought she would. And I still think that she held back. But it was just great to know that she was willing to let us into her her guarded world. Yeah. And that's something we'll we'll touch on a little bit soon when we start giving our thoughts on the on the documentary series, um, I definitely have uh, mixed uh, views about it, I think, after having just finished it. I'm really personally glad that I put quite a bit of distance between when it came out and all the Twitter hype around it because there was an immense amount of Twitter <laughs> Twitter hype going on during when it was airing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And to some extent, definitely deserved. Like there were bits of it that I think were just phenomenal and then, you know, other bits that I think were a bit, little bit undercooked. And I think putting that few weeks between that period and then watching it just before this was recording was a wise move, I think, on my part because I was able to really watch it without being really influenced by a lot of thoughts. Let's, before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about three words. Uh, (laughs) Three words that kind of had the Michael Jackson fan world in a bit of a tiz uh, right before this documentary series came out. So A&E or Lifetime or both, I I don't know who was really in charge of the promo for this whole um, documentary, but the company that was promoting it put out a couple of trailers for it before it came out. And In one of the trailers, there's a key moment in which Janet Jackson, when referring to the allegations against Michael Jackson, said the words guilty by association. And, oh boy, this this really set the Michael Jackson world on fire in a lot of ways. There's a couple of group chats I'm in where it was just all that was talked about for a while. There was, uh, Twitter was just exploding with, you know, people getting upset. Oh my God, how can, you know, because when people typically say the words guilty by association, I guess the implication is that somebody's guilty. And then by you associating with them, you're also thought of as guilty. Now, obviously this was seen not in the context of everything else that was said in the docudrama, but it was kind of a bit full on. Charlie, you've covered a lot to do with the Michael Jackson allegations over the years. So what were your thoughts when you first heard those words? Well, I mean, I assumed that they had been taken out of context, which we found out when the thing came out that they had. I sort of understood why the fans were angry about it, because it clearly did give the impression that Well, you know, those words devoid of context do appear to give the impression that she was suggesting that he was guilty and thereby the family was guilty by association. But it was, I haven't reached a decision as to whether I think it was incompetent editing of the trailer or deliberately incendiary editing of the trailer to generate publicity. It could be either. But I mean, it did its job because 
the media picked up those three words and ran with them, and it generated hundreds of headlines all over the world. Janet says that the family was guilty by association because of the allegations against Michael Jackson. So, you know, arguably, the trailer did its job in that sense, and a lot of people ended up tuning in. You know, it was very successful in terms of viewing figures, but it was disappointing that that decision was made somewhere, either through source of Machiavellian marketing lens or um, idiocy. Do you guys think there might have been a bit of an overreaction, though, on the Michael Jackson fans' side? No, I don't. I I don't. certainly do. Because (laughs) look at the headlines. Look what it did. Just look what it did. Hundreds and hundreds of stories all over the world. Janet Jackson says family is guilty by association. It was obvious. Anybody with two brain cells who was sitting in that edit suite, putting that trailer together, taking those words out of context and not including any of the caveats that Janet had put upon them, anybody with any sense at all would have known that that was exactly what was going to happen. So what I'm undecided about is whether that was the intent or whether the person that put the trailer together was an idiot. But clearly it was absolutely inevitable and 100% predictable that that was what was going to happen if you put those three words in the trailer and don't contextualize them. So I think that I think it was entirely valid for fans to be upset about it. Yeah, that, I mean, that's my view. It, it was completely 100% inevitable that if you put that in the trailer and don't explain it, then that's what's going to happen. I get, you know, the point that, you know, if you want to grab someone's attention, especially when it's coming from the Jackson family, you know, to use a line like that. I mean, you're right. Somebody with the media marketing knew what they were doing by putting those words out there and cutting out things so that, you know, it just catches your attention. I think what made me more upset was the fact that I feel like, you know, MJ fans and Janet fans both have over the years experienced what the media will do to get us riled up. And for me, I just felt like the MJ fans should have been just a little bit patient with us just because we were seeing the clip and we were like, wow. And next thing you know, it was like a rush towards us. And we all was like, wait a minute, we love the same people. You know, MJ fans became Janet fans too, like myself. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt like all of a sudden we were going against each other. And I just was like, y'all just hold up because we don't know who decision it was to do that. And of course me being a Janet fan and I know how much she loves her brother. You know, I don't think Janet would have really wanted, would want that just to get some ratings. That's just, just my point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree with Cam in that, you know, we would have hoped for a little more patience, a little more grace, from the MJ community toward Janet Jackson. Um, And again, Cam brought up an excellent point, which is that Michael Jackson fans, I think I personally overestimated the media literacy because how, you know, Michael was very vocal about how media will use sound bites and clips to distort perspectives, right? And so like, I really kind of thought Michael Jackson fans would just pick up on that. Like (laughs) we need more context because we know how they do things in the media. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was a little surprised. I was a little caught off guard, but it kind of reminded me. It sometimes feels, you know, it, and I got a foot in each world, right? Like I love Michael Jackson and I love Janet Jackson, right? But it sometimes feels like on the Michael Jackson fandom side that there isn't much grace given to the family. Like the fans are sometimes looking for any slip up by any member in the family to kind of turn against them. And it's almost like vigilantism and martyrdom to an extent. And I get it, though, because these are the same fans that have had to fight and fight and fight and fight and every day fight, even after all of these charges have been dismissed. Still recently, you know, in 20, I think 2020, um, another case was dismissed and 
No evidence has been found. The man has been investigated and interrogated, you know, since the early 90s and has been cleared of every charge. And it was mostly because of the fans who cleared his name in the media. Right. Because, you know, the accusation is always so loud. Uh, but then the, the clearing of the name is always so quiet um, unless folks are advocating for you. And so I get that these fans feel like we've done all of this work to clear his name. And here comes this. So I get it, but I was still greatly disappointed. I would just hope that fans on either side would just give the family some grace and hear them out before attacking or making any decisions. Yeah, really well said. Uh, I think Cam got it spot on when she said that the fan community was possibly a little bit too quick to react. And that's part of the reason that I hate Twitter. I think Twitter is just ridiculous. I, I mean, I'll give you several examples of that down the line, but I think that the fans maybe reacted too quickly. I personally sat back and went, hang on, there'll be more to this. There's going to be more context. And it was clear that they had taken it out of context. I thought that the media reaction was over the top because all of a sudden you start seeing all these articles about Janet Jackson and and this negative thing that she said about Michael. and, And she hadn't said anything like that at all. And almost immediately Channel 9 here in Australia started advertising this program that they were going to do, which would air immediately after the documentary called The Rise and Fall of Janet Jackson. I'm just sitting here thinking, well, what are you talking about? She hasn't fallen. It's just, you know, crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Jackson fans are very media literate, but you would expect people that work for whichever TV station this was, I forget which it was that Janet was working with, you would expect them to be more media literate because they work in the media. So if the fans know that a phrase like that is going to be spun by the media and used as the basis for hundreds of smear stories, then whoever made that trailer there's no excuse for not anticipating that. So what you're left with, in my opinion, is two options, which is number one, whoever made the trailer was like a dunce who had no concept of what the media would do with it, or the person who made the trailer knew exactly what the media was going to do with it and put it out there in that form anyway, and deliberately solicited hundreds of negative stories to generate a buzz around the documentary. So I don't think either covers the TV company in glory. I think that it was a poor decision. That said, I think any fans who were assuming that this was Janet's decision and were attacking Janet or were attacking Janet's fans were clearly their idiots as well. So there's fault on both sides. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I don't know for sure. Like, I feel like this was Janet's documentary, and I feel like she would have definitely seen the trailer before it aired, but I don't know that for sure. Um, But what I do know is that, you know, folks know what will get a reaction, and uh, this might have been a gamble they took, I can't say it did or didn't pay off. I know it it generated lots of media buzz. Um, They got lots of free publicity, whether it was the type they wanted or not. It might have been the Kim Kardashian model, which is, you know, I do something outrageous and then I I, I get all the attention and then I try to explain it away. I don't know what what was behind the trailer, but I do just feel like there wasn't. We should have expected the media to do what the media did. Mm. But I do feel like the community, our community's response was outsized. In that, I I do feel like it was kind of sadly ironic in a way because the whole narrative thread around Michael in the documentary was kind of Janet was, you know, fighting for her own talent to be recognized, standing on her own two feet, even though she was for much of her career in the shadow of this giant stratospheric superstar brother. And then the production company decided to use Michael to be the main promotional vehicle in a way. (laughs) If they did, in fact, conspire, I guess, to use that phrase to get media attention, then it's just it's just sad because, again, like, why is it why would it be necessary to do that to elevate Janet? 
Yeah, I agree there. I don't think that that line was necessary at all. And, and I did question the choice, but going to be straight up, been questioning a lot of choices lately. <laughs> um, so <laughs> here, here we are. <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting to that because, yeah, I mean, let's let's um, let's um talk about the, the, the documentary series. I think we should dig into it. I mean, I, I'm still, it's just still in my head, everything, everything in it is, it's just, the kind of documentary that stays with you, I think. I, I haven't been able to switch it off in my head since I finished watching it. So I want to know from from Courtney, from Cam, you know, first of all, I mean, you guys, you run a Janet Jackson podcast, an incredible podcast where you guys cover all the news and developments and, and everything going on in the world of Janet with great interviews as well with people who knew and worked with, with Janet. And this has been a long time coming. It's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's her first, is it her first, I think it's her first TV documentary or any kind of documentary that she's put together about herself, right, outside of maybe like special features for music videos and things like that. Is this her first proper documentary? Uh, yes. So how did you all react to it when you were watching it? Did you Did you wait and see it all in one binge sitting or did you watch each piece as it was coming? When it first premiered, I just took it as it came. Um, each night I was tuned in for it. For me, I think the one thing that I loved about the documentary was she kind of gave a more human side to our father, Joe. I know in the media and of course, in some, in some fans eyes, they view Joe as like a villain, but I think she and her and Randy both brought to the table of what Joe was really trying to do with this talent that he had with his family and the fact that, you know, they're from Gary, Indiana, you know, ain't nothing easy in Gary, Indiana. And he just wanted them to have a better life. And I think she really went more in depth than most of the fans thought she would. I love the fact that she did cover some, you know, topics that had came up in um, over the, you know, the last decades of her career, whether it's this, child, mystery child that she gave away, things about her marriage, you know, first two marriages. And I I just, I felt like she really did open the door to what was going on behind the scenes. And I'm a behind the scenes person. And I I just ate it up like it was peach cobbler for real. I just love (laughs) that, you know, she finally let us in. (laughs) Ah, this is great. Um, I... Have some different opinions, um, and I know <laughs> that Jamie Jay- probably has some questions, so I'll hold some of those for later. Um, but yeah, when it first aired, super excited. It felt like a major event. It was really cool. It really felt like this was the first thing that like the Jan fam could experience as a community. You know, you can go to concerts and and all of that, but like you know, your friend is going in Chicago in April, and you're going, you know, in Detroit in November, and so it's not a community experience. But for us, this was a community experience. Like I was on Twitter. Uh, I know it was mentioned that Twitter is the bane of our existence, but I am a Twitter junkie, and uh, so I was on Twitter all night during the uh, airing, and it was a really interesting experience to see what surprised people to see what did not surprise me. I would say I probably learned, you know, three or four new things, but for the most part, a lot of what was shared, I already knew. Mm -hmm. And even still just like be in community with fans who'd been there since, you know, the fame days to folks who like really only know together again, uh, to be in community with all of those folks on this special night. Like Janet really had us glued to our seats. Like in the United States, those two nights, I think something like 15 or 16 million viewers, like Mm -hmm. that's not a concert. Like you can't do that at a concert. Um, 15 or 16 million people experienced Janet Jackson together. So I just thought it was really cool. Very well summed up. So a bit of a hit then. So it's resonating well in the Janet community. Has there been any criticism or it's been, you know, pretty much straight up, this is great? I think some fans were left wanting more, but overall it's been you no know, great feedback. We Anytime Janet, like I said, lets us in, we're all for it. We love her. Overall, we're, we're just happy to see our girl come, coming back. Yeah. 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 I think some of the feedback that I saw that maybe wasn't as positive was basically along the lines of what Cam said, which is that, 
you know, we sat here for four hours. Like I've seen this, like we sat here for four hours and we really didn't learn that much new. Um, She skipped a good chunk of her life between the Janet album and the Unbreakable album. Uh, You know, we basically got between those years, all we got was Super Bowl. And Mm -hmm. my personal criticism of that is that she could have kept that. Like with no more than you gave us, (laughs) you could have kept that. Um, So I think that that, those were some of the criticisms. Like uh, in the community, I heard people say like she really didn't fight back. And Cam said this. I don't know why I'm saying what you said. You said she, she didn't fight back. Like all of the rumors that have been swirling around her, all the scandal, all of the folks we know specifically who have done her harm. And like, she didn't drop any names. She didn't explain what these things have cost her. And then on top of that, she tried to make us like Justin Timberlake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that the Jet T thing. Too far. When it was like that, I did raise my eyebrow at that. At how she was like, <laughs> I rang him, no, he rang me or something after it happened and he wanted to make mm-hmm. a statement and she's like, no, nah, just don't worry about it. Don't mm-hmm. let it impact your career. <laughs> well, I think that speaks to that speaks to Janet's tactic overall though, isn't it? You, you mentioned about uh, how why didn't you fight back and this, that and the other, but that seems to be her tactic is stay silent, ride the wave and just see it through to the other side and continue on with what she's doing. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. Mm. To some degree, but she's been stood over quite a bit. Um, in her career and yeah. I think yeah to see her stand up and be strong you know and there were parts in the documentary where she was doing that but I think in that that moment about the Super Bowl in particular it was yeah so okay um Carter what did you think when did you watch it what were your reactions I watched it as it came out, so at the end of January. I haven't watched it again since, which I probably should have done in preparation for this episode. But uh, my takeaways were, look, I try and keep everything as positive as I can. I think that Joseph was portrayed quite lovingly, really, and I remember saying to you guys in our group chat that it, it seems to me that they tried their best to show Joseph as a loving father who had reasons to discipline and wasn't a tyrant who was abusing and I think that was quite powerful. It was quite interesting to me that Jermaine, Marlon, Jackie, and Latoya didn't feature much, if at all. Mm. And overall, I actually thought it was a really good documentary. And it's not until I started reading things afterwards that, okay, they've missed this out or they've missed that out. Well, we, we've already mentioned that you can't fit everything into a four hour or four part documentary. And who knows, there might be a part two. The controversy around Justin Timberlake was something that I was maybe going to ask the girls a bit later on because I listened to your podcast the other night and I noticed that that was a, a point of contention in your review as well. <laughs> yes. So I'm interested to get your uh, your views on that. The other interesting point for me was that the platform that it was shown on here in Australia was Stan and I cancelled my subscription to Stan ages ago because they still have and are still pushing leaving Neverland. So for me, it was interesting that that was the choice of platform for release here in Australia, given what else they have on their platform. Overall, I thought it was a very good documentary. I remember commenting to you guys that I think it's the documentary that Michael needed when he was alive rather than the crap that we got from Martin Bashir. Mm -hmm. But overall, I thought it was pretty good. I approach this as somebody who's never really been uh, a Janet fan. I've been somebody who doesn't really know anything about Janet. I've listened to a couple of her albums and they sounded all right to me. But, you know, I never really was somebody who understood the Janet phenomenon. You know, that it didn't, it seemed like she was this big mega star and I just kind of never really got it. And so what I was hoping for from this documentary was something that would explain to me why Janet is great. And I kind of came away from it in that respect, feeling somewhat underwhelmed and a bit baffled in the sense that it almost seemed overall to be sort of negative about Janet and about Janet's abilities. So it seemed to go into a lot of detail and be filled with praise for the Control album. But then once you got past that one album, all I really remember seeing in the documentary after that was a long piece of footage of 
one of her producers telling her off for not singing very well. And then some footage of them recording Scream and telling her she wasn't doing a very good job there either. So it kind of was a bit bemusing to me that Janet has this platform to sell herself and to tell the story about her own sort of legendary career. And in the very end of the very final episode, you've got this sort of protracted montage of people talking about how brilliant she was, but I kind of didn't feel like that was borne out by the rest of the series, which sort of went into great detail about one album and then just sort of frittered out and, and didn't go anywhere. So on the other side, I also felt as regard her personal life, so you're not really getting a huge amount of insight into her professional life. And then on the the personal life side, again, it felt really quite superficial. In many cases, it seemed like she was sort of flirting with the idea of talking about things, but then shying away from them. There was felt very euphemistic at times, very kind of like platitudes and very surface level. For example, the whole section about Joe is this very long and defensive discussion about why everything Joe did was for a good reason. At no point do they actually talk about what Joe did. So it almost seemed to assume knowledge on the part of the viewer. Nowhere is it mentioned that Joe used to stand over his kids with a belt and beat them with the buckle if they got a dance step wrong. Nobody's mentioning that. So it's almost like a really long defense of something that they don't even tell you what they're defending. And then uh, it, it, that just seemed to be a theme that ran through the whole documentary was kind of alluding to things, but not really discussing them. I think the trial, I think Michael's trial, there was a very brief, it was in the Super Bowl section. And it, it was just like almost this throwaway reference of, oh, and of course, it all happened while Michael was on trial. And that's probably why it got so much press. And that was it. That was the discussion of the trial. You're going, hang on a minute, this sort of, this is a one of the biggest events in the history of the entertainment business, which almost could have destroyed your entire family. And it's been discussed for about seven seconds. The Super Bowl thing massively underexplored. I mean, there's so much about that that came out after the Me Too th movement about who blackballed Janet, how they did it, why they did it. None of that is mentioned anywhere. It all kind of felt a bit like fluffy and vague and like just a four hour procession of missed opportunities that was how the whole thing felt to me can i just say something real quick i don't think i guess i'm just a little confused about one little point like janet really to me showed that it really wasn't easy for her she had two albums there wasn't critically acclaimed, didn't sell. And when it got to the control part, I think she was, the documentary showed that Janet, those first two albums was still trying to find a way, find her voice. And it kind of lets you know why control was so, was so good. And even with the Rhythm Nation, it pointed out why Rhythm Nation was so good because it was totally different from control. And as she went through those albums and talked about what she was going through, I mean, to me, it really put let people who don't know a whole lot about Janet know that it didn't come easy. I do feel that she could have dug a little deeper with the Super Bowl, but I think Janet also is to the point now where she's like, hey, it's been, it's, it's no more than what she can say, you know, to really quench everybody's thirst about how it affected her career. And I think that's just the Jackson media training that that's just not going to happen from her, but I don't think it shed, you know, made her career look like it was just all beautiful and no struggle and no obstacles or, yeah. or nothing. I mean, it really shows she had to, it was hard trying to catch Michael and your brother is, you know what I'm saying? The number one star of the whole world. If you mention his name, you know, and she really had to work hard for it. So I just kind of disagree with that that part of 
of your analogy. So many brilliant points were made. I, I wrote down because it is the maybe the best line of 2020 so far, a four hour processional of missed opportunities. That is poetic. I love it. And to an extent, I agree. I think if if you listen to our podcast when we talked about it, I mean, I think absolutely there's only so much you can do in four hours. And so I was questioning some of the choices where we spent our time. And a big question I had when, when it was all said and done was like, if this is the first time I turned on anything about Janet Jackson, I, I don't know. Maybe I know a song or two. Maybe I've heard Control. Maybe I've heard Together Again. But if this is, if I really come to this with a surface level understanding of this woman, do I even now know if she was a good entertainer? Do I, do I, do I have enough to glean that from this documentary? And honestly, I think the answer is no. And so I think that your analysis, although a bit gloomier than mine, is like, I think that there are some parallels. I mean, I just thought that there were a lot of opportunities missed, that a lot of time was spent rehabilitating her father's image. And that's absolutely her right to do so. But yeah, it just kind of assumed that we already thought he was awful. And I mean, I don't know if everybody did or if everybody has that knowledge or anything like that, but I get it. This is a daughter and with editorial control over her own documentary. And so she can spend it, you know, spend the time in the way in which she chooses. And her modus operandi her entire life has been deflection. And so I think that's why we saw so much attention on um, the younger days and Vegas and all of these things, which did add to the story, but we spent so much time there and we just breezed through career achievements. I wanted more behind the scenes, like how did you make this album? What was going through your mind at this time? And the Janet community basically told me to shut up. They were like, we liked it. (laughs) We got what we wanted, which was a more intimate portrait of Janet from her own lips. And so I mean, I can get all both all sides of like what people expected. And I just accept that one documentary can't be all things to all people. There's so many things you guys are all saying that I want to dig in on further. And each each pretty much every point everyone's making is could be a t- whole conversation. What you just said then, Courtney, about hesitancy in the community to say what you were thinking about the documentary or the, some of the backlash people were giving you or whatever, like. I feel that in the Janet community a little bit. I'm going to be honest. Like if I, I, like there are some times when I may not like a song or I may not like something she does or says or whatever, I do worry about like, uh, how can I put this? The Janet community, from what I can see on Twitter, especially Twitter, is very protective and celebratory and defensive. And I don't know, like I, I, watching the hype train when this documentary was coming out for those couple of nights, I wouldn't have dared to say something on Twitter like, oh, that bit was, I didn't like that. Because you know the kind of responses you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> like is, is, that a, is that a thing in the Janet community? Like Michael community has its whole set of quirks <laughs> that I could get into. Is that a thing in the Janet community? I think to an extent it is, but I will say like that is how I feel about the Michael community. But Mm -hmm. I think that is because like the people that I follow on Twitter, like I follow people who will openly critique Janet Jackson, but constructively. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also follow people who like think she's never done any, like she has never made a wrong choice. And I'm like, guys, look at the material. Like, yeah. like <laughs> the songs on so, 20 YO. That, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So I, and, and I do think like, um, I, I think I'm probably a more balanced perspective, but I think there are a lot of fans like me. Um, but there's also a lot of fans on the extreme who everything is perfect. And then we have a weird subset of fans Mm -hmm. that call themselves fans, but criticize everything. Like Mm -hmm. the woman can't cut cut her hair. She can't (laughs) wear black. She can't wear colors. She's always in braids. She's always in a bun. She's uh, like, it doesn't matter what she does. It is not enough. So, And so why do they keep turning up? (laughs) Yeah, we're not sure. We're not sure. I went on a rant. This was probably two years ago. Like if, if the Janet Jackson you want currently is unavailable, then listen to the album from the time of the Janet Jackson you want. But she is a person <laughs> and not a product, so you cannot order it and have it your way. <laughs> and I'm not, not going to go on a rant again because I'm over it. 
Courtney, I think you nailed it there when you said it was Janet telling her story, and that's ultimately how you've got to look at this documentary. It's the story of Janet Jackson as told by Janet. So the things that she's left out, there's probably a reason for that, whether we know about it or not. And, yes, it would have been nice to maybe see a bit more. One of the criticisms I saw was that the the final marriage wasn't spoken about that much or or the son. So – Maybe she doesn't want that in there for reasons of privacy. Maybe there's a prenuptial agreement. You know, there's something there that we may not know about, and you've got to look at it through those eyes. Absolutely. A fat NDA, I'm guessing. Yeah, Janet has control over how her story is told, if you see what I did there. We see. Fantastic. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> All right, so let's let's start going through it a little bit. So, I mean, the first episode, I think, for me – well, the first two, the first half for me were probably the strongest of of the four, mainly because the story is given kind of like what you were saying, Charlie Thompson. The story was given a lot of room to deepen in the first two, like the whole journey out of Gary into LA and then her on good times and, you know, just TV in general and fame and then finding her feet after the first two albums and then eventually getting into control, there was just so much depth and you could really follow it as a narrative to me and you could feel her struggle in wanting to achieve, I guess, success and then eventually getting there. Like it was, I had a sense of when she, when you, when you, when the documentary shows you the level of success control started having, I felt a sense of, yes, you, you did it, you know, you got it. And um, I think it really succeeded in that. I don't know. Let's talk about the family stuff because, well, first of all, can I just say I've never truly appreciated how awesome Reby is <laughs> until this documentary. Reby is the best, Jackson. What is yes. wrong with you? I, I, <laughs> I, the best. I, I don't know. I just haven't given her time and I feel bad for that. But she is beautiful and the way she talks and she is just, I like Reby. I'm, a, I'm sold. I'm a Reby fan. <laughs> And I'm glad she had a big part of this documentary, actually, because when you think of it, she's, you know, big sister. So that's a, that's a, I don't know, she holds an important role in the family and especially in her relationship with Janet. So I'm glad she was able to tell the narrative of the family story. Tito, he was given his points of view and that was fun. And, you know, Ran- you know what's weird to me is <laughs> kind of how, how little Randy's in it. Like Randy's in it, sitting on couches <laughs> and saying random stuff. Grateful. But like, <laughs> That's my one word for that. <laughs> <laughs> Grateful. Like if he's co-producing it, wouldn't you think that maybe interview- <laughs> interviewing him? But anyway, let's talk about Joseph. So I think, Courtney, you just said that it's her right to revisit Joseph and humanize him a little bit do you think we got a truthful joseph no why well i think of it clearly it's it's um everybody is a bundle of contradictions and joe perhaps more than anybody i just felt it kind of went a bit too far in trying to defend joe because Yes, I understand that Gary was a gang-infested neighborhood and he was very frightened about his children ending up in the wrong company or ending up in trouble. I understand that Joe's discipline of his kids clearly led to great things for them, but there is a difference between punishing your child for doing something bad like misbehaving or sneaking out after curfew or whatever a child might do which would merit punishment and beating your child with an implement because they have not performed a dance routine correctly. Those two things cannot be compared. And when one of your own kids gives multiple interviews saying, the way my father treated me was so horrendous that I was so frightened of him that when I saw him, I would vomit. That's not healthy, and that's not really defensible. And the other thing you have to look at, really, is the way things panned out for Michael. Because there's no question that Joe and his family have made history. We'll never, ever, ever, ever probably see anything like the Jackson family. To have a family of nine siblings 
And is it six of them are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And two of them are two of the biggest selling artists in world history, right? That's amazing. It's incredible. But just look where Michael ended up. It wasn't healthy and it, and it, you know, it just wasn't, it just wasn't healthy. So I just kind of felt like it was a bit OTT and, oh, everything he did was for the right reason. There's no right reason to beat your child because they've got a dance routine wrong. There's no reason. There's no justification. So it just kind of felt a bit like it had it, in trying to write the balance it kind of tipped too far the other way. That was how it felt to me. Not just the physical abuse, but also his affairs. Like they're fairly well publicized at this point. And that didn't feature, and maybe Janet was too young, maybe at that point to have felt the impact of that on her life. I don't know. But, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't an angel. <laughs> and, you know, she wasn't trying to make him look like an angel, but, you know, I don't know. I just kind of felt like that it wasn't as accurate a representation of him as maybe it could have been. Um, all, all I would add to the conversation is that it would seem, I think it was very important to her for her father not to be remembered as a villain. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that in her mind, she thinks that he was perfect. In fact, I think that she thinks she, he's very far from perfect. Um, but I think that she struggles with the way the public views him. You know, every article you read that praises the Jackson family has kind of this preface or preamble about the iron fist with which they were raised and basically makes it sound like they were tortured into performing. And I think from her perspective that she does not feel that that is the entirety of her father. And so I think what we got was a little bit of, it was a lot of revisionist history, but also her perspective would be massively different from the other, other older siblings, I would imagine. Um, she didn't spend as much time with them. And by that time, I'm not going to say he had probably mellowed, but probably compared to the way that he had been in the past, mm. um, he was probably a little calmer. You know, the, the stress of not being able to feed your family or provide a larger enough house or whatever might have induced some behaviors that had subsided by the time some of those things weren't concerns. But I'm sure even then, like the Joseph she grew up with was probably far from winning any parent appreciation medals. Um, but I think we just have to take it with a grain of salt that I think for her, this was really important to do after passing. Because one of the things I learned, you know, my father's gone and one of the things, all of the things you had hoped that you would achieve, like you had hoped dreams that you had together and so they're gone. And I think a dream Janet Jackson carried until the very last moment was that she would have a true rec reconciliation and a, a strong father-daughter relationship with her dad. And I don't mm -hmm. know if she ever got that, but this might have been a way that she was able to do something after his death. Yeah. That's my perspective. I think that has been shining through in her career for some years now. Like ever since True You and uh, her single, what was the one with J. Cole? No Sleep. No Sleep. That's it. There's a part in No Sleep where she's like, I don't know what location that is, whether it's an apartment or a house she owns, but like there's a part of that where like there's a projector projecting onto the wall of a house she's in this, um, you know, footage of her dad. And that was a pretty recent song. That's only, you know, five years ago or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, her dad's been on her mind, I think, quite a bit for the last few years. And that, that obviously was a big part of this documentary as well. They did sort of touch on it at the very end, didn't they, of the last of the, the final episode when he attended the tour that she was filming this documentary for and she talked about a, a conversation they had. Um, that was another thing that I found a little bit weird about it was like how the documentary started out as let's film everything that we're doing for this new tour, but the tour was barely anything to do with it. Like it... it 
it it morphed so far away from that that it was kind of weird in the bits where they were showing her getting ready for it. And like, I think they showed her at the very end. I don't know if they showed her performing in it, but they showed her rehearsing for it. And I don't know. I, I just got lost in those moments. Like, when are we talking about? What are we talking about? What show? What's she trying to accomplish here? Like, it was, I think they just should have totally gone the other direction and just not even touched that tour because it's like, what's the point anymore? In terms of like moving on to the other episodes, like episode two, um, I think this was probably a highlight for me. Although by the end of it, like I wrote a heap of notes. I'm looking at my notes here. When I got to the end of episode two, I wrote a note saying, there's a lot of Michael going on. (laughs) This is meant to be a documentary about Janet Jackson and Janet's career. And what I was hoping for before watching it was more discussion around her collaborations with Jam and Lewis, how innovative her music was at the time. Because it truly was like, you know, not just only her choreography and performing, but the actual sound, her, her sound that she developed with Jam and Lewis was incredibly inspirational for many other artists that came out in the 90s who were all like New Jack Swing, Teddy Riley style artists, all influenced by Control, Rhythm Nation and that Jam and Lewis Minneapolis sound and more exploration around the studio and the work, I think, was something that I I was really after. And then for it to be, I don't know, I was just kind of a bit... Even as a Michael Jackson fan, and I'll never say no to more Michael, but watching a Janet Jackson documentary, there was a lot of Michael going on. Like it sometimes felt like 50 to 75% about Michael sometimes. What do you guys think? On the point about Michael, I was kind of the opposite. I thought, oh, oh, I I wanted a bit more. As more of a Michael fan than a Janet fan, I wanted a bit more of the relationship with Michael, um, maybe delving into the, the personal side of it. But I go back to what I said earlier, which is you know, she told what she wanted to tell. I think she may have even put more of Michael in had Catherine been comfortable with talking about it. Mm. But we saw quite an emotional scene with Catherine where she just said, look, I can't. And that's completely understandable. Back to the point about Joseph, I think the criticism of Joseph and his methods is warranted at stages. So I agree with what Charlie was saying. But then, yeah, obviously what came of it was brilliant, but did the the ends justify the means? But then I would also delve into the point that it wasn't a documentary about Joseph and his methods. It was a documentary about Janet and how she wanted to tell that particular part of the story, and it's entirely up to her how much or how little she puts in. Yeah. Well, I get what you're saying about, like, there was a session where it was – you know, a good amount of Michael. But I think that I like the fact that she did include Michael a little bit more than what fans were maybe expecting because it kind of made me, reminded me of, like, when she was showing us the scene where her and Michael were writing the lyrics to Scream and she reminded him, like, you're doing a lot of swearing for for mom, you know, and things like that. I think she did it because, she wanted us to know that that bond for Michael was there, has always been there, and kind of just let us know that she misses him more than maybe she puts out to the public. Because mm-hmm. you got to think after his death, I mean, she went on the BET Awards and just had to you know, do her little statement, and that was tough. Mm. So I think, yeah, she could have eased back from Michael, but I think the other part of her was like, you know, letting us know how much Michael really meant to her behind the scenes that we didn't see. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And also you mentioned earlier that Michael was the benchmark. He had Thriller. He had the biggest selling album of all time. At one stage, I think that Bad, shortly after its release, was the second or third highest selling album of all time. So that was the target that she was trying to reach. Yeah, yeah. And I think there was a great moment in the documentary as well where she attended his performances in London for the Bad concert and it took, the documentary talked about that being the the moment in which she, you know, set her mind on wanting to be a massive live performer as well, like Michael. Yeah, I was trying to collect my thoughts because I think, you know, as, as far as how much Michael appeared in the documentary, I think there was a host of reasons for that. But I think it was her way of celebrating him, but also her way of sharing um, kind of a behind the scenes perspective, because I think there have been loud criticism that Janet has never done enough 
for Michael, whether it be during the trial or or during leaving Neverland or all of these things that come about. And, you know, it people want her to be more vocal. Like if she really cared, she would make a statement. If she really cared, she would sue these, you know, fools into oblivion over her brother. If she, if she really cared, you know, she'd make her own Michael Jackson rebuttal documentary if she really cared. And so I think that this was kind of her perspective. This was her way of saying like, our bond was our bond. It wasn't for public consumption, but I'm going to let you see a little bit behind the curtain. So maybe you can understand that I, it wasn't, I didn't owe my mourning to you. I don't, you, you don't have a right to what it is that I'm doing to support my family. That's not actually your business. But mm-hmm. I do want you to know that the bond that we have, I did my very best to maintain it. And I'll always do my best to protect his image. But first, I'm going to protect this relationship. And I think that is just her MO. And so I remember when the whole Leaving Never- Neverland thing was at a fever pitch and people were like, why hasn't she said anything? And Janet community is like, we're still waiting on a Super Bowl statement. Like we, she didn't even get to that yet. To think that she would break her silence. I think that her perspective is like, smother it with silence. Like I will ignore you till you die. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just, I just feel like this was her way of saying like, I may not address directly the things that you want me to say, but I want you to know that this person was a huge part of my life. So super important to me. And I just want to put that on display. Mm-hmm. She actually did it, in my opinion, to her peril at times. It's probably won't be popular. Um, but I felt like it wasn't edited well around the conversation about how she lost a deal with Coca-Cola. So that seemed a little, little sketch. And then the other part where she was, we talked about her recording scream and how her vocals, you know, they were, <laughs> I think Michael said something like that. Ooh, was not good. The second. Um, ooh was not good. The second. Ooh, was not <laughs> the first good. One was good. <laughs> not <the second. laughs> and she left it there. Like that was just the end when we all know that there was like this epic battle of like, like him doing a bang up job in New York. And then her being like, nah, I'm going to do mine in my studio in Minneapolis. And then her doing a bang up job and then him hearing it and, him being like, okay, well, I need to go to Minneapolis too. Like, we needed that. Yeah. That was fun. That was good context. But it kind of just left it like, dopey little sister couldn't c- cut it, you know. And I was just like, ma'am, this is your story. <laughs> yeah. that's And that's, I guess, that's how I felt about a lot of the documentary is, okay, we got a story, but let's dig in a bit more. So, there's a few things that weren't really explained about that. Like when she, th- and that was a fascinating bit where she was talking about, how Sony Music was controlling the Scream video shoot set to the point where they wouldn't physically allow her and her team to interact with Michael. What was that? That was crazy. I, I wanted to learn more about that. Okay, so there were some pretty shocking revelations as well in the first couple of episodes. One thing that's been talked about a lot on Twitter is also... David Bowie's interaction with the kids, like the family, when he would visit them. I think he visited them for some kind of event or something like that and started offering the Jackson kids drugs. Like that that was pretty shocking. When Janet and the family first moved to LA and experienced racism, when she talked about being called the N-word when she was walking down the street, that was confronting and necessary and shocking as well, I think. Really showed you know, what the climate was of the area that they moved into, I guess. Like, I I don't know much about LA in general, but I actually had no idea. I knew they moved into like a pretty affluent area, you know, in in Encino, but because I don't know about the cultural makeup of LA or the social makeup of LA, I had no idea, you know, it was a predominantly white area and that they were confronted by that kind of racism so early on. Yeah, I don't think I had the details, but I think that I was not shocked. I am hardly ever shocked about stories of racism in the United States, particularly not shocked about stories of racism in the United States in the 1800s through 1980s. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that a lot of times people forget 
that in addition to all the other burdens that you you have to endure to to succeed at the level that this family was able to succeed, like they still have to deal with regular black American BS. Like there's just an extra burden that you have to cut through and that you're expected to like do it with your head held high and be be better than the next guy and not react when these things happen to you and you're just supposed to put them away and go on with your life. And I know that didn't end for them in 1976. And so for them to continue to excel and to continue to be great, um, I thought it was really important that she put that in there. Again, it seemed strange because it was kind of like, the Bowie story where it was like dumped in our laps and then we moved on. Yeah. That's a big deal. (laughs) But I thought it was important to include it, even if if, if only for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. So once you get into episode three and four, like, I I don't know what you guys felt, but like, for me, it was kind of like, this is where things sped up a lot. And you've got like uh, the Janet album, you've got Velvet Rope, you've got all for you and Demeter Joe are like barely mentioned. Demeter Joe's mentioned in the context of the Super Bowl. And then then it's just a whirlwind. Like it's just it speeds up massively and there's a lot more talking heads. And it kind of feels like there's there wasn't a lot of journalistic due diligence done to some of these projects. Like, for example, you'd have people like Mariah Carey or whoever just saying, this thing was great, but there's no like explanation why it's great or unique or there's no, you know, they're not exploring the musicality and the impact of the songs and the music videos. And, you know, Janet is a fashion icon. There's a, there's a lot that wasn't really explored. It was just mentioned as being awesome, but maybe not why. Like for the first couple of episodes, that was done quite a bit for Control and Rhythm Nation. So we get to the Super Bowl. You mentioned earlier, Courtney, something about there was there was enough of that or too much of that. You didn't need more of that. You felt like it, it went on a bit long. It did go on a bit long and said much too little. Okay. I felt like the time that was dedicated to it was necessary, but it did not address any of the actual scandal or any of the background behind the scandal. And it's really interesting that this documentary comes out this year when we've gotten so much more information, um, you know, about Les Moonves and CBS mm-hmm. and uh, with uh, the documentary, I cannot recall the name, but by Jody Gomes, I can't re- recall the name. Uh, New York Times presents Super Bowl scandal or something. I, I think it was yeah. something like that. The malfunction, the whatever it was called. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I feel like it just didn't, you know, if you're going to talk about it, talk about it. And if you're not, like, give me the Ms. Mrs. Jackson uh, response, like, I can't and move on. Because it just, it, to me, sh- she cleared up zero things. Like if you came to this documentary with questions about the Super Bowl, be it what actually happened or be it how it impacted her career thereafter, if you came with questions, I don't think you got them answered. Right. No, that's right. Well, let's let's explore it now a little bit. So if you if you had creative control over this documentary, first of all, tell me, how significant do you think the Super Bowl incident was to her career? And secondly, how would you have explained it or not explained it, but explored it? I think one thing that I felt like about the Super Bowl was it should have been featured more. Mm -hmm. The one thing I wanted her just to bring out about the whole Super Bowl incident was the fact that the consequences and how unfair it was to her career. Pretty much break down the numbers, like just go through how it affected you mental, you know, because mental health is very important in these times. So take us through that, you know, show us how, you know, the record label distanced themselves or how, you know, you getting those reports from your team that, you know, your video is not going to be shown on MTV, VH1. CBS Viacom properties, to be specific. Yeah. Yeah, to be specific. So I just wanted her to show a little bit more of how it really affected her And because I think a lot of fans, myself included, we wanted her to give us something more than just, you know, I've moved on. No, Janet, tell tell the people how how it left you and how it scarred you and, you know, I'm saying how it interrupted your life and how unfair it was. But once again, her being a Jackson, I think she just took the the higher road, which is no problem. But, you know, tell us, dig a little deeper. So, Cam, I think it was saying about you didn't really learn anything about the Super Bowl incident. I was the opposite. I actually learned a hell of a lot more 
from it? Because I guess I didn't really know too much about the incident other than, okay, her tit came out, you know, and there was a, it was called a wardrobe malfunction and that's how it was sort of addressed. Now, when it actually happened in 2004, I was, what, 18, I think, 17 or 18 years old. And I'll be honest, my uneducated point of view at that time was, well, it has to be deliberate. Why else would you wear a decoration like that underneath? But even if it was deliberate, so what? Like, it's it's not like she's full frontal nudity or anything like that. It's it's the lights went down and it was done. She said it was a mistake. Okay, I can believe that. But in the documentary, they sort of went into her immediate reaction. I think you can read a lot into things by people's immediate reaction. And she's covering herself up with a towel. She's crying. She's getting away from stage. She's humiliated. I think that that in in itself is very telling as to whether it was deliberate or not. So I actually learned a lot about the incident from this documentary that I didn't know before. Well, that is fantastic. I am excited to hear that, to be honest, um, <laughs> that this has this has uh, shed some light for some folks. I think maybe, it, you know, for those of us in the Janet fandom, many of us knew that. So th- that, that was me assuming that, like, everybody knows stuff about Janet Jackson, and that's probably not right. That does change my perspective. I do think it was so monumental, and I was, I'm still of two camps. Like, I kind of just wanted her to lay it out there. I don't think she owes us her pain. And so sometimes I feel like people, we feel like we have a right to understand your emotions. And I think that she's at a point where she's just like, that hurt really bad. I've buried it really deeply and I've moved on. And I think we have to be willing to let her do that. But at the same time, I feel like maybe this portion was not for her to tell. Like you you should tell your own story in whatever way you choose. But I think if we really want to understand what happened, it probably wasn't going to happen in great detail in this context. One, because I don't think she wants to revisit it as as deeply as we want it revisited. Like for me as a fan, what I really want her to do is to talk about like this had a major financial impact. And I also think not just a major financial impact, but like we know she lost deals. We learned that through Coca-Cola because of something else that had happened in her life outside of music, this was directly related to like trying to promote an album and now this happens and you're on the tail end of a deal with Virgin and you're getting ready to make a decision about, well, they already had a promotional campaign for that. And so that was turned upside down, but also now your value sinking a little bit, like you're dropping in the draft because of this situation as you get ready to negotiate your next contract. And then you're not getting support from the Recording Academy. It, all of these things that are happening and people are actively trying to take you down. And I just felt like in that moment, it felt very much like we got Michael on the run and now we got this great opportunity to take down another Jackson. Like this is what we've been trying to do since the 80s, right? Like this is this is what we've been trying to do since MTV let beat it on the air. So we got them. We got them in our hooks and it felt like every every entity was mounting to kind of dismantle this family. And so I still feel like it's a story worthy of being told and it needs to be told in summation, like the economic impact, the emotional impact, but the impact on the musical landscape as well, the impact on society, how this was really one of the first major campaigns by conservative PACs or whatever you call them, conservative coalitions. This was one of the major, first major campaigns targeted entity to kind of push forward some laws. So they were able to push forward some things that the FDIC, um, who controls our communications and TV and radio and all of that here in the United States, they were actually able to mobilize and use this incident to do that. Um, And she was used as a stool pigeon to do that. And so like, I need this story told in its totality because a lot of people think like her boobie was out and it was, but the aftermath was so much more. Very well said. Very well said. Well, Courtney said something a little while ago she about the Super Bowl incident, she said in the documentary, it went on too long and said too little. And that was kind of how I felt about just vast swathes of the whole documentary series. Also, you know, we were talking a little while ago about how it seemed to be quite Michael heavy, but it kind of it did and it didn't. So there was a lot of airtime given to Michael but it was also vague and nebulous and kind of almost speaking in forked tongues or 
or alluding to things and not really exploring them, that trying to work out what Janet was telling you was a bit like trying to catch mist in a butterfly net. It was like, what what are you actually telling us? Just these very cryptic, strange asides that would, you know, oh, there was this incident where he came in my room and he just sat there and didn't say anything to me and then left. Yeah, but what does that mean? What are you telling us? You know, then the the whole thing about the scream video where Janet was saying, oh, I was hoping that it would be just like the old days, but the longer it went on, the more I realized that the old days had long since passed or something like that. And it's like, what does that mean? Are you saying that he was being a dick? Are you saying that he was ignoring you or that he was rude to you? What are you trying to tell us? It was all so nebulous that I couldn't really work out what was going on a lot of the time. Like, am, am I, is this a metaphor? What am I not understanding here? This all just seems to be just like people have cut a sentence out of an interview and dropped it into the middle of this documentary with no context. And I'm just supposed it's like a guessing game. And I'm supposed to work out what you're trying to tell us. And the Super Bowl incident and the episode was very similar to me. The first thing that struck me is that this is really the first time that Janet has addressed this enormous controversy in her career, almost destroyed her career. The first time she's really addressed it. And at no point is any explanation given as to what actually happened and how it happened. There is no oh, it was supposed to, a bit was supposed to come off and not the other bit, or, oh, you know, Justin's hand slipped and he accidentally rips part of my top. There's no explanation given for what happened. And when I was looking online at people that were tweeting about the documentary, they were saying kind of, this seems to be as close as we're ever going to get to Janet saying it was deliberate, it was misguided, and oops. Right. That was, and I kind of have always been of the opinion that it was probably deliberate. Certainly very, very difficult to imagine how it could have not been deliberate. And the lack of explanation kind of feeds into that belief. And the whole section of the documentary about the Super Bowl was like that. There was no explanation as to how or why it happened. There was no explanation as to Janet's immediate reaction, what she felt about it, what she thought about it. No real detailed explanation as to what the immediate fallout was, what the financial impact was, what it did to the rest of the family. It just was so nebulous. And then all of this stuff that's come out, this really important stuff that's come out in the last few years since the Me Too movement, where we found out about who orchestrated the takedown. Why did they do that? The mechanics of it, how it's extended into all different areas, the publishing industry areas, the publishing industry, huge takedown of Janet Jackson, just not mentioned, just not mentioned, none of it. Just so bizarre, so many bizarre decisions with this documentary. And I, I understand what Charlie Carter is saying about this is Janet's documentary and Janet can tell as much of her story as she wants to. And that's her right and whatever. But my view is kind of, well, if you're not ready to tell the story, then don't make a documentary. What's the point? What's the point of saying, Oh, I'm going to make a tell all documentary about my life, but I'm not going to talk about this, that, that, this, anything that's interesting. I'm not going to talk about, but the rest of it's fair game. It just all seems so bizarre. And I just, by the end of it, I was just kind of pissed off. I I enjoyed the first episode or maybe the first two episodes. I watched it when it first went out, which was about a month ago, and I kind of don't remember what was in what episode. But I just remember that the longer it went on, the more nebulous and bizarre it seemed to be just wafting around 
that suddenly she's got a baby. Nobody knows how. No mention of the fact that she even got married. Literally not even mentioned. Not even mentioned the fact that she had a third husband. Yeah, it's just, it's just a very, oh, I, I, I always wanted to be a mother and now I am. How did that happen? The stork, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> she talked about needles. She talked about IVF. She didn't, she didn't say the words, but she talked about visiting doctors and getting needles. And- yeah, but she didn't talk about who the father was or the fact that she got married. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, weird. the whole thing is just so odd. But he's one of the richest men on the planet. I'm sure there's like a massive NDA going on there. I'm sure but- there is. But so just say, I got married, can't talk about it because there's an NDA. But to just not mention it is just weird. Right. It just leaves the viewer going, what the hell happened? You know, so the the Super Bowl thing to me was just inexplicable. Why would you have this platform and not even explain how or why it happened. It was just insane, I thought. The the longer the series went on, it was almost like they wanted to get in as many touch points as they could, but the more they tried to cram in, the more superficial everything had to become. It reminded me of the James Brown song, Talking Out Loud and Saying Nothing. That was what it felt like to me. Right, we've mentioned the kid, we've mentioned the Super Bowl, we've mentioned Joe dying, we've mentioned the trial, we've mentioned that, yeah, but you've not ex- you've not gone into any detail about any of it. So it's all kind of like you might as well just read Wikipedia. That was how I felt by the end of it. Can we just for a second, just for my own curiosity, I need to I need to understand the Super Bowl thing, the mechanics of it, the logistics of it. Please help me out. But there's a lot of people that will say completely not deliberate, completely accidental. Janet has said that. There's a camp that says it was deliberate. I need to understand this. So the leather exterior of the costume was meant to come off the cup, right? That's We all agree on that. That was meant to come off? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But underneath that, the idea was that there was meant to be a red cup that was going to stay there. It wasn't a bra, right? Like it, it was meant to be another red cup mm-hmm. because it, is that the case? I, I just can't understand the logistics of what was meant to go on because even if yeah. it, if that was meant to happen, if there was meant to be another red cup that was to stay there but you could easily remove, isn't that like the worst design of all time <laughs> for protecting Listen. what could have happened? Well, I. You know, I have a follow-up question, right? Let's let's assume that that version of events is true. So Justin is going to rip off the leather bit, and then there's going to be a red bit underneath. Why? What's the point? What what is that? Mm. That's what we're like. This is the greatest. What you know? One of the greatest show women allegedly of all time i'm gonna have to fight you for that allegedly <laughs> the, the big finale of her super bowl performance is to tear off four square inches of a costume and reveal that there's a red bit under it that does not make any sense it just doesn't i make get sense. it it's sexy it, it would have been a red bra thing. it would have been cool it's, i get it no that's not it's not it, you'd rip the whole thing off that's it's just so that i just don't buy it you i just think You've got to really be drinking the Janet Kool Aid to believe I that. I think, Charlie. No, I want to hear. Sorry, Carter. I'll let you go in a sec, but I got to hear from Courtney and Cam. Please explain to me the logistics, and please explain to me: Do you one hundred percent believe this story that that her her explanation? Please tell us because. Your answer will determine, like, oh my a little bit how we talk about this uh, section of the first, documentary. <laughs> first of all, I have just enjoyed so thoroughly this conversation, and <laughs> like seeing Janet through the lens of a non-super fan, or maybe not even a non-casual fan. Like, I, I don't know what what to call it, but I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And one of the things that it has, um reminded me is like if you are not a Janet fan if you do not follow Janet Jackson like everything she says and does is in some way esoteric like she rarely just gives you an answer like is the shirt red well on sunny days (laughs) pink with white can look red but on that day it was cloudy 
So you're like, is the shirt red, Janet? <laughs> um, and so it's like it, listening to you talk, you're basically just describing like her personality in a nutshell because that's what she does. And, and that's what this documentary was. It was just, I think she thinks that this was the most straightforward, <laughs> um, <laughs> well-curated uh, uh, production of her life that she could offer. I think that she, we, we think she gave us just the shallowest, most surface level. And I won't say we, maybe everyone doesn't think that, but to me, it felt in some ways surface level and shallow. Um, but I think she probably believed that she was like drowning in the deep end with what she revealed about herself. So uh, it's hard for me to critique that because like, we're basically asking her to be someone she isn't. Like this is what it is. In regards to the Super Bowl, I d I don't think it was intentional. I think that something different was planned, but she has never said specifically what was planned. Um, and but also the whole malfunction thing seems weird to me um, because however you feel about Wayne Lucas, he's an excellent stylist, and I think he has been a in her camp, like he would never want her to fail. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think he would put anything on her body that would fail um, on, mm -hmm. on a national TV. So I don't know what the story is or what the big reveal was. To me, the biggest mistake she made was inviting Justin Timberlake. Like to me, that was the <laughs> ultimate mistake. Like everything <laughs> that happened. Yes, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> everything that happened after that, I was like, bam, this kind of on you, boo, because this shouldn't have even, there shouldn't have been an opportunity for this. But to me, that moment is so little because if even if she planned it and I really don't believe she planned to put her nipple on TV, like what would that get her? What would that gain? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think she meant to put her nipple on TV. But even if that is what happened, so what? Like I have to look at dudes nipples all the time. So like <laughs> I just to me, it was just the right. Like and a lot of men have way bigger breasts than Janet Jackson. And but we're <laughs> we're fine with that. That's OK. Because they can't feed a baby. Is that why it's OK? So like to me, the whole hysteria about it was just silly to begin with. So whether they intended or not, I still don't think that they did. I think something was planned that we don't that they haven't said, which they could easily do, which is very confusing to me why we are have chosen to leave it in this nebulous space that we have have done so. And there were also other options too, like the Super Bowl is pre-taped. They have lots of rehearsals. We know that people, tech people have to know what's going on. We know that there was a version they could have used. We know that they could have cut to black. We know that it was only on for just hardly any seconds. And most people in the stadium didn't even know what happened. And most people at home who thought they might have known what happened would have never known if people had kept talking about it. So to me, purpose, not on purpose. She said it wasn't. I got to take that. That's probably the most direct thing she said, even if she didn't do a very good job of explaining anything. Immediately after it happened, she said it wasn't on purpose. And then I think she kind of got irritated. Like, y'all going to keep talking about this, even though I just told you, like, that was an embarrassing moment and I didn't do it on purpose. And y'all just want to keep talking about it. OK, I'll shut up for 20 years. Do you remember Michael doing the Geraldo interview? Because he seemed to be kind of alluding to the fact that it was deliberate because he went into this whole explanation about the hypocrisy of everybody being upset by it and told the story about a streaker at the Oscars and said, you think that guy got there by accident? You know, that's, that's all deliberate. It kind of seemed like Michael was saying it had been deliberate, do you not think? That's how I always read what he was saying in that interview. Mm, I've seen that interview. And again, it's kind of like the Jackson way of like not giving you an answer answer. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't even say if I believe that Michael believed it was deliberate, but I also couldn't say if I would know for sure that Michael would know given where they were in their lives at that time. So I think that he was just trying to back up his sister. Like, I'm going to try to <laughs> say something that is supportive. So I don't know if even he knew the exact answer. For me, the mystery is still unsolved. If any evidence pointing towards it being deliberate for me is just the design of that costume, but then I can't ignore the fact that her immediate reaction, even on stage after it happened, like you can physically see that she looks, whoa, what, what was that? Like her left hand kind of twitches a little bit to move up to try and stop it, I think, and then before she looks shocked, her head's down, and then before you know it, it's cut to black. And then in the documentary, of course, they do show um, the towel covering her walking off stage. So who knows? Who knows? Carter, you were going to add some thoughts as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, the reason I thought at age 18 or in the immediate aftermath that it was deliberate, there was a few reasons. Obviously, the decoration, the fact that the rip was clean, not just the black part, but the alleged red part as well. Uh, also, the lyrics of the song at that particular time, going to have you naked by the end of this song. Oh, no, you're naked or semi-naked. You know what I mean? That's sort of all tied in together to make it look deliberate. And it's not until a bit later on that you go, well, hang on, there's a bit more to this. And the documentary, look, the Janet documentary, for, for me, I'm leaning towards it being an accident, but you can completely understand why people think it was deliberate and how they think it could have been deliberate as well. I know the more important thing is the disgusting reaction by the media and then the impact on the family and what it tells us about how women are viewed and treated in America and, you know, black people of power especially. And so I know all of that's more important. I am a little frustrated because, like you guys are saying, this was her chance to kind of explain all that, and I know she doesn't need to, but it was a big deal. (laughs) And I think it deserves to be kind of clearly articulated and explained so there's no doubt anymore in the viewer's mind around what happened. I think you're right in what it tells us about society, and even if it was deliberate, And that's kind of, I kind of lean that way, but I wouldn't be confident enough to say definitely. But so what? And the media reaction was ludicrous and clearly vicious and venomous, you know, and kind of mendacious and hypocritical, you know, because as you said, there, there were rap videos on MTV every day at that time with women sort of gyrating in men's laps, barely any clothes on. You know, the music that was popular at that time was extremely graphic, sexual music. And the idea that one second of Janet Jackson's boob being out on the Super Bowl was this horrendous affront to public decency it was just ridiculous, you know. And I think that what we also see, one thing that Janet's documentary tells us is about how little attitudes have changed since then, because we were talking earlier about the David Bowie story, which is in the documentary. And that is a deeply shocking story a really terrible and damaging story about David Bowie, that David Bowie attended the home or of the Jacksons or certainly a property where the Jacksons were at and was offering drugs to children. That's a terrible story about David Bowie. I didn't see any media outlet run that as a story. So Janet saying guilty by association generates smear stories all over the world. And then Janet saying, Michael called me a cow when he was a child. That generates smear stories the world over. But David Bowie was offering drugs to children. Apparently not a story. What does that tell us about society today and about the media today? So I do think although I was not terribly impressed by the documentary series itself, it did kind of tell a story to anybody that was paying attention about how nothing has really changed since the Jacksons moved into that neighborhood in the 70s and were being racially abused. And nothing has really changed since 20 years ago when Janet was blackballed for, at most, an extremely minor infraction on television. We're still in the same place today, societally. Mm. Is Michael Jackson calling someone a cow is somehow worse than David Bowie offering drugs to children. It's just ludicrous. That is a story in, it, in itself, I think. that That's a story that tells us a lot about the society that we live in and the media in in our society also. The media hypocrisy is astounding just purely because at the time that it happened, you've got tabloid newspapers in the UK where I, where I grew up sort of, you know, damning Janet 
and to a certain extent Justin Timberlake for what happened at the Super Bowl. But these same newspapers on page three have topless girls that they're you know they're perfectly happy to to put a photo out there for the public. The hypocrisy was just ridiculous. Mm. Now, girls, on your podcast that I listened to, you were particularly critical of Justin Timberlake and you alluded to the fact uh, a minute ago that you didn't think he should have been part of that performance anyway. Can I just ask, is your – hatred's a strong word, but we'll go with it. Your hatred of Justin <laughs> Timberlake, did that come about as a result of the Super Bowl incident or was that something that you, you felt before that happened? Well, I always – before the Super Bowl incident, I always felt that Justin was cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was a big, you know, follower of NSYNC. So I knew what kind of vibe, you know, Justin was. But it was the Super Bowl incident for me that changed my point of view of him. Because number one, and I think I said this in a previous episode, even though Justin was young in his career, he had a lot of power. I mean, he had made a lot of record execs some money. So he had power. And the thing that frustrated me with him was he played by their rules, which is, oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Read a little statement. Bam. I'm going. I'm playing on the Grammys and I'm winning them. I'm good. My career, I hook up with Timberland and forget about Janet. Whereas Janet was left holding this pot, this mess, and to pretty much just dived on the sword. But... It is a fact that Justin and whoever was behind him, they knew what they were doing. Justin was on, Instinct was on 106 and Park. You know, they were, when they were getting ready to release Justin's um, Justified, you could tell that they were going to push him into black homes, get those sales up, and make sure that he crosses over to both platforms to make sure he's a pop star. But my dislike for Justin came when he just didn't have her back. He really, he didn't even say, yo, be fair to Janet, hear her out. She's going through something. He was like, I'm gone. Peace. I got my Grammys, my performance. I'm back in the studio. And from there, I don't care if he sells another record. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just me. Yeah. Hatred is strong. I don't really hate anything but mayonnaise. Um, but for, for <laughs> this is all I got. Um, for me, I really didn't, I was kind of Justin Timberlake neutral. I mean, I think everybody knows JC Chavez should have been the leader of and sing, but I, I was pretty much neutral on Justin Timberlake. But prior to this moment, the reason why I said he shouldn't have been on that stage is because Justin has always been a culture vulture. He kind of slips in and out of the black community when it's convenient um, and then he disappears when it's not convenient. And I, it is really what has been my problem because my thing about black folks and music, like if you got some skills, we don't care what you look like. You know, we like we're for it, but don't don't play us. Don't use us when it's to your, to your advantage. And so, you know, Cam was generous and said he didn't have Janet's back. But I would I would venture to say that he kicked Janet when she was down and continued to kick her. I think as late as like 2011 or 2013, he was performing some song about, oops, what he did to Janet and what he did to Britney. Like he was performing some mockery song about that. I mean, he's just been flippant um, in his response since then, all the way up until that first Jody Gomes documentary is when he first said like a public apology. And I want to harken back too to like, Justin basically gave a little apology and that's why the Grammy said that he was allowed to come. Janet had already delivered a videotaped public apology that aired. I think it aired on like our six o'clock world news um, in the United States because I guess it was that serious. I don't know. She had already issued this like very emotional apology, which you could tell she did not want to apologize. I could tell like when she thinks she hasn't done anything wrong, she don't want, she don't want, she did not want to say it, but she did. And she was like fighting the tears. Then they gave the reason that she wasn't invited because she didn't apologize specifically to some specific individuals. And I was like, oh, okay, you wanted to see her breast again is what that sounds like to me. Like we should have investigated you for feeling like you needed to see her alone. But fast forward. So my problem with Justin Timberlake isn't just what happened that night and how flippant he was about it, like immediately. But like after he aged, we could say he was very young 
when the incident happened and maybe he was misguided. But for the next decade, um, he continued to make flippant remarks about it um, and kind of cast a cloud over everything Janet has said about the incident before. And so to me, you know, Justin Timberlake definitely gives yuck vibes. So I wasn't probably (laughs) going to ever be his biggest fan. Um, But but this incident let me know that, like, you really you shouldn't even be over here. Like, why are you over here? That's how I feel about Justin Timberlake. See, that's that's so interesting because I can think of another Justin that far offends me more just by his being. And he hasn't actually done anything to annoy me, <laughs> that Canadian one. And I have another Justin who I like a lot more. But it's so interesting. Just wanted to point out also that Justin Timberlake kind of had form already by the time he ended up on the Super Bowl with Janet, because his whole solo act was essentially a Michael Jackson tribute act. He was recording and releasing songs which had been offered to Michael and rejected. He was dressed as Michael half the time. He had the fedora on, he had the glove on, albeit, you know, like a leather glove or something to try and distinguish himself. But then when the allegations hit in 2003, he could not run far enough away from the Michael Jackson comparisons. And I remember there was a TV show that used to be on in the UK. It was called Star Stories. It was a comedy show where they would have impressionists who would play celebrities in kind of half hour comedic biopics. And there was a a Britney and Justin episode of Star Stories. And the running joke throughout the whole episode was about how every time you saw Justin Timberlake, he was dressed in a different Michael Jackson costume. But every time somebody said anything to him about Michael Jackson, he'd be like, who's that? I've never heard of Michael Jackson. So, mm-hmm. and then he'd say, anyway, I'm going off to play with my monkey bubbles or something, you know. So he kind of had form already for modeling himself after Michael, making a big deal about the fact that he was this huge Michael fan. But then when liking Michael became toxic, he was, no, I'm sick of everyone comparing me to Michael Jackson. So it was kind of disappointing anyway at the time to see Janet on stage with Justin. I remember there were celebrities who came out and defended Michael at the time after Neverland was raided, and he was not one of them. He was nowhere to be seen. So, yeah, he kind of, he has this reputation as a kind of a culture vulture. And it does seem like he is a bit fair weather. You know, after Michael died, suddenly he wanted to be involved again. Then leaving Neverland happened. You never heard from him again. There's the whole Prince thing also, where he ended up in the big spat with Prince, where he was just being a complete dick Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. he just is he he just seems to me to be a quite a problematic character in a number of ways can you tell me more about that prince bat so justin timberlake had a song called sexy back and prince gave a performance somewhere where he came on stage and he said sexy never left right that was it that was it it was just a joke he just came on stage and said oh Sexy never left. That was it. And Justin Timberlake reacted like a child sure and did. just really, I, I don't remember the exact lyrics, but he released some diss track about Prince where he was like, oh yeah, well, if you're so good, how come no one buys your albums anymore? You washed up old twat mm-hmm. kind of attitude, right? I can't remember exactly what he said, but that was essentially what he said. It was so wildly disproportionate. I mean, Prince hadn't even criticized Justin Timberlake in any way. He literally just made a pun on the title of a Justin Timberlake song. And Justin Timberlake just went so wildly insane about it. And then, but then after Prince died, Justin Timberlake, suddenly when he's playing the Super Bowl again, um, while Janet still essentially is blackballed from the entire industry, He wants to do a virtual duet with Prince, which Prince was on record also in an old interview as having said that he was vehemently opposed to any kind of posthumous duets, that he didn't believe that an artist should be used after they've died to participate in a duet with somebody that they might have not approved of. The word he used was demonic. 
he said that it was demonic to uh, to it take somebody who's dead and force them into a posthumous duet with someone. And they so you have Justin Timberlake, this kind of petulant, whinging child who's engaged in a really quite vicious and unnecessary attack on Prince while he was alive. Now that Prince is dead and flavor of the month for a while, he just suddenly wants to be riding Prince's coattails and do a a virtual duet with him, which he did, much to the disgust of a lot of Prince fans. So he does have this kind of history. And then, of course, if you watch the Britney Spears documentaries, he comes out of those very poorly as well, because he was giving interviews or boasting about the fact that he'd had sex with Britney Spears in quite a horrible Donald Trumpy type way. So he just strikes me as generally a problematic character. And it was weird and strange also to see Janet being so defensive of him in the documentary. It kind of was like, why are you doing that? And again, a lot of people read that as essentially like a tacit admission of the fact that it had all been deliberate. Like the only reason why you would be defending this guy is if actually you know that it was all deliberate and that there's really nothing to criticize him for. And it's unreasonable to expect him to keep apologizing for something that you asked him to do. So that kind of fed into, again, this reading of the documentary as being kind of indicative that it did happen on purpose. I'm going to be fast because I know this part is going on too long, but thank you so much for addressing the prince because I had written that down like, oh man, I didn't say that. That's another reason, you know, in 2018. So we're talking about like this straight, there is like a straight line of continuity of jerkiness from Justin Timberlake. And another one was just this whole spat with Prince and how he really elevated that spat from nothing, but then had the nerve to perform in Minneapolis in a duet in a fashion that Prince specifically stated he would not do. So I won't rehash that. I'll move on to the other two pieces of that that really irritate me. One about, you know, earlier I said (laughs) some of these choices that Janet continues to make are confounding. She still shares a publicist with Justin Timberlake. So she is still represented by the man who threw her under the bus. I don't have time to look for it, but he made this long, the publicist made this long IG post in response to that somewhat of an apology that Justin Timberlake put out 17 years too late for Britney Spears and Janet Jackson um, when the Britney Spears documentary aired. The publicist made a public statement on IG in regards to it had been too long and Janet had not acknowledged his apology. He was like, the least you can do is acknowledge Justin's apology. Now, of course, the publicist was upset because she was paying him dust, which is what she tends to do. And um, Justin had that really terrible looking movie coming out. And so he was just getting so much press. I can't remember the name of the movie, but the movie looked like it looked like a poor, poor impression of a movie that would have been shot in the 50s. That she still shares a publicist with Justin Timberlake is like confounding, among some other choices. But I just want to point that out. And he was also noticeably absent from this documentary. So she was kind of like saying, oh, you know, we talk on the phone now and have a good relationship. Well, this would have, if he truly had in his heart uh, remorse and wanted to apologize for how he behaved after it happened, maybe this would have been a good idea for him to come on and explain, yeah, I was a dick. I screwed up. I didn't, you know, but he didn't again. So... Not that I would have wanted really to see him on the documentary, but <laughs> exactly. if they're legitimate friends, like she says they are, then wouldn't he want to do which, that? Which no one believes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right. So final thoughts on the documentary. We've been a little critical of it here and there. I do think there are some amazing things about it. The first two episodes to me are really good. Janet's work with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis and, you know, her work in general is 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 amazing and I absolutely love it. Her albums, my favorite Janet albums, of course, are Control, Rhythm Nation. I love Velvet Rope. Velvet Rope's incredible. And I still, I need to spend more time with Janet. It, how do you say it? Is it Janet or Janet Period? Janet Period is a fantastic album. I thought you were saying the Janet Jackson album, which has some good cuts, but like no one needs to spend more time with it. <laughs> I need to spend more time with Janet, period, because 
uh, I wish that had a little bit more love in the documentary as well. Like they just focused on the album cover quite a bit, but also a really great, great album. She's got an incredible body of work. I hope that in the future we've got a lot more work from her still to come. I'm excited to see that there's more tour dates coming up. Final thoughts on the documentary. Courtney. I guess my final thought is is for as critical as I was, and I said this on our podcast, like I know that I have said some critical things, but to me it still gets an A plus in my heart. And the reason for that is just it's such an incredible feat for her to be able to tell her own story. Um, regardless of what she chose to tell, it was just tremendous that she was able to do so, that she was able to do so like around the world, that she was able to captivate 16 million and who knows how many now in that first weekend um, in the United States that she was able to have this documentary shared across the globe. To me, that's a, a huge accomplishment. And if very much feels like something she didn't necessarily want to do, felt like something that was on her to-do list to check off. Still, I'm just so proud that she was able to do that. A lot of people don't get to tell their own story and then you're stuck with whatever people cobble together for you after you're gone. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I appreciate the foresight that she's always had about curating her own identity. I mean, for all the criticism that I offer to this, I think it just leaves room for more. So if she chooses to share more, I will be so delighted. Um, and if this is all that we get, then I'm just glad she was able to do it on her own terms. Cam. I still give it an A. My only thing is, I think, and I, I think someone brought this up, once you get to like part night two or episode three and four, it kind of lingers off the on the behind the scenes stuff. And I think Velvet Rope is one album that should have really been featured just because it influenced so many generations of up and coming dancers and singers and entertainers. So other than that, I think Janet told a story. She put it out her way. And even though I want more, I'm going to take what the queen gave me. Love it. Okay. Carter. Um, overall, I really enjoyed the documentary. I learned a lot more about Janet than I knew before as a sort of casual fan who has obviously been aware of Janet since forever, but more into to Michael. I'm not, I still to this day don't know a lot of Janet's back catalog and that's something I'll have to look into. So it was a good eye opener in terms of her and how she found her way into the industry and her place within the Jackson family. One particular quote that sort of stood out to me was the point where she was saying that I'm not just Michael Jackson's sister, I'm Janet. So that was quite powerful. There was a documentary about Michael years ago on the BBC and a quote that came out of that that I've always remembered is how Michael Jackson will be remembered will be determined by who tells the story. And I wonder if that was a motivation for Janet to tell her own story uh, in this particular series. And I think that she did a good job. Um, one question I was going to ask the girls earlier was if they thought that this might have been a calculated way the use of Michael in this documentary to bring over some of Michael's fans, such as myself, to become more aware of Janet and her catalogue and perhaps be a little bit more sympathetic to her. But overall, I thought it was a good documentary. Would love to see more. Hope there's a part two someday and, yeah, continued success. Charlie Thompson. Well, you know, I kind of felt like it reminded me of David Guest's Michael Jackson documentary, The Life of an Icon, in that that starts out very strong and then just kind of runs out of steam about halfway through. So you get the first half of the movie is telling the very beginning, like the origin story, all the way up to, you know, Michael meeting Quincy. <laughs> And then <laughs> the whole rest of Michael's life is just like, oh, and then he did some albums that he died. And that kind of was how it felt for me with this Janet doc. So I felt it started out pretty strong. I mean, still had issues with it, like the Joe stuff or whatever, but it started out pretty comprehensive. Like the description of Janet's career in the early years, her talking about how Joe was kind of pushing her into doing it. She didn't really want to do it. The early albums that she wasn't really into up to control and her sort of blossoming as an artist, that all felt quite strong. And then much like Life of an Icon, it just kind of went, oh, and then she did make some other albums. Her brother died. There was a Super Bowl thing in the end. And it just kind of was like, you know, just collapsed like a souffle. 
it kind of felt like it needed to have been more episodes or something. I think um, it was good to see how successful it was. I was pleased to see the viewing figures were astronomical. I mean, compared to, for example, Leaving Neverland's figures in America, it was an extraordinary success. And that was nice to see. And it was nice to see because she did address some of the stuff about Michael. As uh, somebody said earlier in the show, she kind of did that at her peril to praise Michael Jackson in any way or defend him, particularly post Me Too, is a um, rebellious act. It's a dangerous thing to do, but it was nice to see her do that and to see her do it in a, a documentary, which was just so wildly successful. But to me, as a as a documentary, it just kind of felt a bit like a failure in the sense that I didn't come away from it feeling that I really understood Janet, the artist, and I also came away from it feeling that all the most important information about the woman was also held back. I also felt it was a missed opportunity. There was nothing, I did. I forgot to mention it earlier, nothing in the series about what a great ally she was for the LGBT community at a time when it was not really very favorable to an artist's career to do that. You know, she, that was very bold of her. That's kind of a difference between the Janet then and the Janet in this documentary, I felt, was that Janet used to feel like a very bold and outspoken artist and a risk taker, whereas the documentary felt very safe and reserved. And it was a shame. It was almost like she was shying away from that part of herself because that was such an important and big part of her career. I mean, she was a gay icon and she was a huge ally to the LGBT community. And she did a lot of work for the cause of AIDS together again. One of my favorite Janet songs was dedicated to everybody suffering with AIDS at that time and was written in response to a friend of hers death from AIDS. And it was, it just kind of felt like a shame that none of that was mentioned because it was such a big part of Janet's fan base and Janet's career. I don't know. It just felt like there were a lot of holes in it. It felt like an incomplete series, which was a shame, but it was nice to see it perform well even if I didn't particularly think it was pulled off spectacularly. Great thoughts. There was a quote in the documentary that stood out to me. I can't remember exactly the words of it, and it was said by the – who was the guy with the long gray hair? That was Wayne Scott Lucas. He was a stylist. He said a quote about all of Janet's life. She's had to navigate men, whether it be Joe Jackson, you know, husbands she had that was trying to exert control over her. and. I found it interesting when, I don't know how, what you guys thought of this bit, when when they were talking about her uh, split with Jermaine Dupree and somebody asked her, the producer or somebody asked her, like, why did you end up, you know, breaking up with him? And she laughed <laughs> and she was like, oh, he was playing up, like, you know, he was cheating on me. And she was kind of giggling about it. And like, I don't know, like, I just... I really thought when that when they got to that bit in the documentary, they would have or she would have discussed that as being really painful. But, you know, she talked about lots of other aspects of her life being painful. But in that particular moment, like her longstanding boyfriend is cheating on her and she's like laughing. She laughed about it. I don't know. How did you guys react to that bit? What did you think of that? I think that Janet has been on record before saying that when she gets nervous or upset about something, her natural reaction is to laugh. Yeah. So that didn't surprise me too much and the fact that it cut away to the guy in question saying i did things i shouldn't have done that annoyed me he didn't own what he did did he really Mm-mm, not, not at, at all, all. It was a joke. and I, I do think that she has shared before like i think you know i can't say anything about this last relationship that apparently doesn't exist but um <laughs> Up until that point, she said that she'd never been in a long-term relationship with anyone who did not cheat on her. Mm. Um, And so I think a lot of people were really shocked with the Jermaine Dupree revelation. And I was like, well, I think he's probably in that anyone, guys, Mm. which is stunning to me for a host of reasons. But (laughs) she she really helped Jermaine Dupree come up. (laughs) But yeah, so I think that, that her reaction to that was 
weird, but I think I told Cam, I was like, mm, that seems like a mistake she's going to make again. So let's just get ready. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, it's been really, really wonderful chatting about the Janet Jackson documentary. Thank you so much for coming on. Courtney and Cam, you guys host your own amazing podcast. Uh, as I said at the start of the show, it keeps audiences up to date on Janet Jackson news. You guys do great explorations and analysis of her songs and her albums and talk to people that, that knew and worked with Janet as well. Uh, what do you guys have planned for your own podcast for this year? We have some plans. Um, we're continuing to do more of the same. Um, we will have some new and exciting guests. And, you know, our, our, we've had a couple of good ones in the past. So if you're new to the Janet Jackson fandom um, and want to know a little bit more about Janet Jackson, I suggest you start with maybe the Jesus Garber episode or the Wayne Scott Lucas episode um, to really get a picture, a portrait of the woman from people who worked with her. Um, and we also talked to fans. So we had a recent episode with someone who has become known as the Rhythm Nation twins, half of the Rhythm Nation twins, mm -hmm. um, a lady of a, a, a a, a couple of fans that had an extraordinary experience uh, with Janet Jackson during the Rhythm Nation era, um, so much so that they eventually went on to pr present to her the Chairman's Award at the NAACP. And so, yes, yeah, so we talk to fans and hear their stories. And really, we do this because we never thought we'd get a documentary. <laughs> we thought if someone didn't tell this story, then no one would. So we're super excited that the documentary exists, but we're <laughs> going to keep plucking. Uh, we got some guests that I don't want to share Ooh. yet coming up, but I think folks will enjoy it very much as we continue to explore her catalog and, and explore with her collaborators. So we're super excited about what's coming up. Mm -hmm. That's great. And how can uh, listeners connect with you guys if they want to find the show and, and you guys on social media? You can find us on uh, Twitter and Instagram. It's at Janet Jackson Pod for each of those. And then you can find our podcast really anywhere that you get your podcast. So Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, just wherever you, you are. And we love for folks to chat with us. So if you see us on Instagram or you see us on Twitter and you enjoyed an episode or you have a question about an episode, drop us a line. We talk back. Fantastic. And same for the MJ Cast listeners. You can find us at the MJ Cast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, we can be searched on all kinds of podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We've got lots of episodes similar to the Janet Today podcast, interviews with people who knew and worked with Michael, and lots of news and roundtable episodes. So please uh, subscribe. We would love to have you join our listener base uh, and to keep up with us and what we are doing. Charlie Thompson, where can people find you online? At the MJ cast. <laughs> You're not sharing the personal account anymore. <laughs> Too much love coming in from MJ fans, huh? Oh, I'm sure. And from Janet fans as well after this. I'll have it coming from both directions. And Justin Timberlake fans. But Carter has pissed off the Bieber fans. So he's going to be in for a, a whole world of pain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, Carter, you, you know, when, uh, when, when the time comes for my wife and I to have ha our baby, which is late uh, May, you will be taking the reins a little bit with a, with a bit more of the hosting. So if people want to connect with you on social media, where can they find you? Well, they can find me at C.E. Tom. No, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, so they can find me at Charlie W. Carter on Twitter and Instagram and uh, or Alpha Charlie Photos on Instagram as well. Uh, I am on Facebook, but I don't tend to do too much in the Michael Jackson world with that. So, uh, yeah, Twitter or Instagram it is. Great, great. Well, we hope everybody enjoyed this episode of the MJ Cast. We're going to be back in a month or so with another episode and look forward to seeing you guys then. Keep Michaeling.
Man, that was great to talk to the Janet Jackson Today ladies again. They're awesome. Is there any aspect of the documentary that we could talk about more or cover more? I think the amount of unfair treatment possibly that Janet got from not just the the media but sometimes from inside the industry. For example, obviously we've we've covered Justin Timberlake, but there is a video doing the rounds on uh, YouTube of Prince doing a word association game. I don't know if you've seen it. And the, the guy playing it with him says, Michael Jackson, and Prince says, genius. And then he says, Janet Jackson, and Prince says, genius's sister. Mm. Yeah. So there's a little bit of sort of from inside the industry, a lack of respect at times for Janet. Well, I, I mean, I would not go so far as to say that saying someone is not a genius is some kind of attack. You know, no. I do think that that is a fair assessment, to be honest. I mean, was Janet a huge megastar? Yes. Is Janet a genius? I'll leave that up to you. But I don't think Prince saying she's not a genius is necessarily a, a, a terrible slur. No, I know. But I, I mean, it's it's another example of a comparison to Michael. And like it was a... <laughs> well, we, we've seen that Prince is quite clever with words and his, his punchlines anyway when it, when it came to Justin Timberlake. And I suppose that's just another example of perhaps him being a bit flippant and, and trying to be a bit funny. Mm. Well, there's two sides to it. What do you think about flipping it, though? So is it disrespect or what about would Janet have been the artist that she was if her surname wasn't Jackson? If Janet Jackson walked into a record label with no family ties, no backstory of the Jackson 5 and everything behind her, do you think she would have got where... She is. Do you think she would have passed an X Factor audition? So there's two ways of looking at it. So you could say that the constant comparisons to Michael are unfair, or you could say, actually, the association with Michael probably is is at least moderately to blame for the career that she had. Oh, I think it's without doubt that having the surname that she did in the family, she did open some doors for her. It, you know, there's both ends of the spectrum. It's also led to some perhaps more harsh criticism than a Nelly Furtado would have got, for example, you know, just a- another random female artist that just happened to be reading her name at that point. But guys, we've got to remember too that, yeah, like, look, let me be honest with you. Singing, I can't sing, but lots of people can sing really well. Uh, as a school teacher, I know there's dozens of students in my school that go to, you know, that are in the music program that sing beautifully that sing amazingly, that sing better than people that are really famous. And maybe maybe Janet Jackson, you know, maybe the name did count for quite a bit. But to me, it's never really been about her raw ability as a singer that's made her incredibly attractive as an artist or famous. It's, it's her decision-making, her hard work, the people that she's chosen to collaborate with. So when I say that I love Janet Jackson albums, I'm not just talking about Janet Jackson's vocals or whatever. I'm talking about the music, her collaborations with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, you know, the just the people she worked with that were incredible choreographers, her videos, the people who directed her videos. Janet Jackson's a whole body of work mm. to me that are influenced by incredible collaborators. So, um, where, sure, maybe she's not the strongest vocalist in the world, whatever, but as a decision maker in the industry and the products that came out of her collaborations with people like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, I stand by the fact that some of her albums are, are the best in the world, are best in class. There's nearly every list that's released of the top 100 albums ever. You know, Rolling Stone uh, magazine always puts out, you know, every five years or so they revise their top 500 albums of all time. You've always got Control, Rhythm Nation and Velvet Rope. Mm. And I think they absolutely deserve to be there. Do you think that there's an argument there for, because you're talking about Janet's decision making, but one thing we didn't really touch on in the main show is particularly about the Super Bowl. Uh, I meant to mention it at the time and I forgot when we were talking about how sort of lamentable it was that Janet was performing with Justin. But there was a feeling at that time that Janet's career was kind of on the slide. And at that time, she had a reputation for announcing tours and then cancelling them 
with reasons that were given kind of viewed with skepticism and people suggesting it was actually because the tickets weren't selling very well. Her album sales were not as amazing as they had been. There was a general consensus that after she stopped working with Jam and Lewis, the material wasn't as strong. So when you're, so when you say Janet Jackson is a body of work, that clearly is true, but there is a general consensus that Janet Jackson as a body of work with Jam and Lewis is a very different thing to Janet Jackson as a body of work without Jam and Lewis. So to what extent do you attribute is Jan, were, were those albums great kind of despite not is, is Janet Jackson's participation in those albums material to their greatness or if Jam and Lewis had taken the exact same songs to Whitney Houston, would they have been as good or better, do you think? But I think what the documentary revealed, it wasn't Jam and Lewis taking songs to Janet Jackson. She was involved actively in writing them. Janet was very instrumental in the Rhythm Nation album in particular, in Velvet Rope. She's all over that. You look at, um, you know, I agree, definitely. I don't think any, I, I don't think any reasonable music fan would say that her albums after she finished collaborating heavily with Jam and Lewis are better than the Jam and Lewis albums. That's like saying Invincible's better than Dangerous. That's not a thing. But yeah, her her latest albums are uneven from starting with All For You onwards, really, even though Jam and Lewis um, produced a majority of All For You. Demeter Joe, 20YO, Unbreakable, Discipline, all of those albums are uneven. There's a couple of good songs on some of them. Mostly it's just her experimenting with different contemporary R&B producers. Um, nowhere near as important or as good. I'll be honest, All For You is probably oh, probably my favourite Janet song. It's a great song. I don't know why. I just, like, I've always gravitated towards that song in her catalogue. And, yeah, I mean, I get the, I understand the, the comparisons with people like Whitney Houston and if you gave her the music and would it have still been a hit and things like that. Janet is an icon in her own way. I think she was or is one of the most beautiful women in the entertainment industry and I think Josie agrees, okay. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I think she she deserves her status as a solo performer but you just, mm, I don't know where I'm going with this point but I just sort of, I can see why she's got a following, but I can also see why there is some validity to some of the criticism. She's a hard worker. She's the whole package. It's you can't just look at Janet and go, "Oh, she's a she's incredibly famous because she's an amazing dancer." She's not an amazing dancer. She's got great choreographers. She's not an amazing singer. She's got brilliant producers. Um She's the whole package. It's how she brings a whole team of people together. It's her vision for the songs. And it was also a little bit of right place, right time. Like she was coming up and and really started collaborating with Jam and Lewis when a totally new sound was developing. You know, that late 80s Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis sound informed pretty much what most of early to mid 90s R&B sounded like. So... She was on the cusp of a musical explosion of new sound mm. as well. It was she I I often kind of think of it like she used them and they used her. Like she in a way was a vehicle, I think, for Jam and Lewis to get their production sound out to the masses. And she was an incredible platform for that to happen with. And she used that sound to express what she was feeling in her great albums. So mm. I think it's been definitely an eye opener this episode talking with uh, with Cam and Courtney. You know, some people whose point of view of Janet is similar to ours of Michael, and sometimes it is good to get a different point of view. And obviously, they're a lot more heavily invested in Janet than than we are. But I've really enjoyed this episode and uh, this discussion. It's been great. The other cool thing I like about it when Michael and Janet were at their height of power in the industry, so really in the the late, the very late eighties and early to mid nineties, they were together a force to be reckoned with. Like there wasn't a year that went by without a major Janet or Michael album tour or video. And uh, boy, did they rule the scene together. 
I think that's the most powerful. The only moment in the series where I got goosebumps was where Michael was in the studio recording his scream vocals. And it kind of struck me that I don't know what the editorial decision making was behind what was and wasn't included in the documentary. But I mentioned it earlier that it was kind of a trend after control that everything you saw of Janet's creative process, I don't know whether this was deliberate coincidence or what the reason for it was, seemed to be kind of negative. So it was, you know, the the footage of her having a big argument with whoever the producer was because they kept telling her that her vocals on Rhythm Nation weren't good enough. And then there was the footage of Scream where Michael records his vocals and Jam and Lewis are just going, oh my God, Michael came into the studio and he was amazing. And then they go and then Janet recorded her vocals and it kind of is, there's something, some cloud hanging over it, you know, and then they play the clip of Michael saying that her ooh wasn't very good. It all just seemed, I kind of, I what I wanted to get out of this documentary was a, a new appreciation of Janet where I could go, Now I understand people have been telling me for years that Janet is amazing. And now I understand why she's amazing, but I just didn't get that. What I kind of got was actually, I got an explanation for why, in my opinion, she's not a particularly good live performer, which was that (laughs) she had been a recording artist who did not tour. And the first tour she ever went on was this gigantic stadium tour where she was trying to put on this huge spectacle, but she'd not really had that apprenticeship that most artists would have of starting in the tiny clubs and moving up. That kind of was explained to me, but Mm -hmm. there was nothing in this series which said to me, this is why Janet is brilliant. And that kind of felt like a failure to me. Yeah, I agree. There needed to be more more um, detail and discovery in the musicality, particularly of the groundbreaking albums with Jam and Lewis. There was not enough of that. Even the talking heads they had on there, like Questlove, he would have been the perfect person to explain how impactful that music was and why it was impactful. Instead, all the talking heads just kept saying it was amazing, but nobody ever said why it was amazing, which which I found disappointing. But, yeah, I do encourage you, go, go and listen to Control and Rhythm Nation, Janet Period and Velvet Rope. Those four right there are excellent albums. I, I really believe I that. Yeah, I have. I've listened to those albums, and what I get out of those albums is I quite like the production – on some of the tracks and that kind of is the end of i I quite often i can't understand anything janet is singing i've got to be perfectly honest it's kind of like a great funky production and then somewhere underneath it all you can kind of hear like (laughs) and you just get i can't understand anything how's it go that's it well exactly you know, Pete Mills messaged me a while ago and sent me a link to a Janet Jackson song. I said, do you listen to this song? It's amazing. I listened to it three times. I said, Pete, I, is this a practical joke? I can't understand a single word that she's singing on the song. I can't make it. Maybe I'm old and deaf, but. No, you just, I just think you're approaching it wrong. It's not, you don't listen to Janet because you want a Whitney Houston or a Mariah Carey. She's a part of the music. I just, I just listen to it because it's, it's really just her, for me, it's her vocal harmonies. It's the layering of the vocals that are almost second to none. To me, there's three artists that like four artists that layer vocals better than any other artist. There's Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Marvin Gaye, and Mariah Carey. I think, they are incredible at doing that. And it's the way that Jimmy Jam and, and Terry Lewis bring out the, the vocal layering and blend it in with the rest of the music just to be magic. And I don't listen to Janet because I want incredible lead vocals. I listen to it because of the, the funky vibe of the music. Can you understand what she's saying, though? Yeah, sure I can. Sure I can. I, I just can't. I, I, there's a lot of her songs where it just literally says, it's like, one. What do you, you know, it's not hard to press next when you're listening to a Janet album, which I mean, and that's, I don't mean that in a, I know it sounds really derogatory and I, I don't mean it that way, but you know how with Michael's albums, 
every song or every other song is killer. It's a, you know, you can listen to the whole bad album and you might skip over Just Good Friends mm. or you can listen to Thriller and you might skip over The Girl Is Mine. But with Janet, it's sort of you want to get to that together again or All For You or What Have You Done For Me Lately or, you know, maybe even you skip past that one sometimes. But it, it's just not the same uh, quantity of quality, shall we say. But that's not to say that she's a bad singer or, like I say, I love All For You. It's one of my favourite songs, not just the Janet, just out there. Do you think we're just saying that, though, because we're hardcore Michael fans? Like, if you were no. speaking to a hardcore Janet fan, would they turn around and say, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of Michael songs I'd skip? No, I really think that with All For You, I didn't even know it was Janet Jackson the first time I heard it. I just heard it on the radio and went, I really like this. And then when they said it's Janet Jackson, I went, oh. It is an exceptional song. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some of the songs are quite forgettable I, to the point where I don't even know their names. But, I mean, if I, on a scale of naught to 2,000 watts, I couldn't tell you how bad it was. But <laughs> it just. <laughs> naught to 2,000 watts? <laughs> <laughs> 2,000 watts is the naught. Gonna... Sorry. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say one to 2,000 watts, but I thought it doesn't deserve a one. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, there's another aspect of Janet's career too. Like, she, women have it tougher than men in the industry. I really think that. Like, absolutely. Once you get to a certain age, the industry tries to wipe you off. Like, and that's what happened really with Janet once she got to the 2000s. All for you, that era, the 2001 All for You era. She was, she was. The industry considered her really. You know, I think pretty hot still. Mm. You know. Um, not just visually, you know, but also in terms of her appeal to younger audiences. That was a very successful album and era. Yeah, and with Michael being on the slide, that accented that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it, it really outperformed Invincible in a lot of ways, that album. Mm -hmm. They were released pretty much at the same time. But then as soon as you get to the Super Bowl era, era Janet's a bit older at that point, and it doesn't worry me, but, I mean, the industry, obviously, you know, there's a pattern of the industry trying to, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is Janet realized that and she started to experiment a lot with, um, you know, like you were talking about earlier, Charlie Thompson, you were saying that in that period there was a lot of sexual sort of uh, content in R&B music and in videos. And I think that's around that era that Janet really started ex to experiment with a, diff a lot of different R&B producers other than Jam and Lewis and that style of video to try and appeal to a younger audience and it came across as a little bit forced and certainly very cursory compared to the depth of her work before that was dealing with a lot of social issues and things like that. Well, I think that there's, certainly there is a lot of ageism and a lot of misogyny in the music industry and, and the entertainment industry generally. This happens to actresses as well. They kind of hit 35 and then they can't get a gig for 20 years until the industry wants them to play someone's mum. And in a film, you know, you can have like a 60-year-old leading man he will never have a 60 year old leading lady. The leading lady will always be like 35. So there is a huge amount of ageism and sexism in the ent entertainment industry generally. I think that possibly though, when you are a Janet Jackson slash Britney Spears type artist, pop artist, who, as you were describing earlier, Gemma, kind of not an amazing singer, not an amazing dancer, but kind of a jack of all trades. There comes a point, I think a lot of that is carried by image. And then if you're Barbara Streisand, you can weather that because you have got a talent which is so astronomical that it doesn't matter how old you get or what you look like because that talent is going to carry you if you're Aretha Franklin. You know, Aretha Franklin was still really, when she was pretty, you know, when she was in the era that we're talking about Janet entering in her life, she was recording a duets with George Michael, for example, right? So I think if you have a, a huge talent, then you can weather that storm. Celine Dion has done that, for example. But with Janet... I kind of do think it was difficult because when your act is very physical and jumping about on stage and, you know, high energy, and it's the same thing that happened to Michael, really, you know, as he got older and was trying to keep up with what was expected of him, it kind of 
ground him down into into a, a mush, you know, and he couldn't, he just couldn't do it anymore. So I think that that definitely is part of it with Janet is that she did not have that. I and I think what wasn't she kind of recasting herself as an actress by that point, which was real smart because. She was, she's actually a pretty good actress, I think. Well, she's always been an actress. She was in Good Times. She was in Fame in her early career. And then later on, she was in Nutty Professor 2 and the Tyler Perry movie, Why Did I Get Married 2? And yeah, yeah, she's always been an actress. Yes, you're right. She was always an actress. You're you're very right. But she kind of moved away from that a while for a while, although apart from the Tupac film, I think, and kind of became Janet the pop star. But around that time, she seemed to be transitioning back towards Janet the Mm. actress, which I think would have been a really smart move. And Tyler Perry is kind of an indie outsider character within the movie industry. You know, he's not, he doesn't get a lot of respect within the movie industry and the entertainment industry. He's a huge success, but he is kind of frozen out of the mainstream and he could make the best movie of the year, but he's not going to get nominated for an Oscar, you know? So she kind of still was relegated to this outsider status, which again, you know, touches upon some of the stuff we were talking about earlier about race and the media industry generally. I would love for, you know, it'd be interesting to know what, what would Janet have become without the Super Bowl? Yeah. Where do you think she would have been five years later had that not happened? With the Janet community, like, it's almost like if you criticize something, there'll be lots of fans that come in and discredit you or try to discredit you for reasons like, I don't know, like gender and race. Like, if I was to go on Twitter right now and say, I hate the, um, I don't know, what's an album? Like, I hate the Demeter Joe album, even though I don't. If I said that, I guarantee you there would be some like quite a number of fans that would give sort of snarky sort of replies in the comments sort of, you know, alluding to the fact that maybe I'm sexist or racist or something like that. Is it, is it, it can't be just the Janet fan base that's like that though. It is Twitter in general. No, no, I get that when, from when I criticized Invincible, I got, um, what's her name? VP, what's her name? Saying that I was racist, that, you know, white people saying that Invincible is bad is racist. Uh, it's not just a Jackson family fan community. I, I, I'm a member of um, one of the fan groups for The Darkness, uh, a rock band based out of England. And let's be honest, their first album was really strong, Permission to Land. The second album wasn't bad, One Way Ticket to Hell and Back. But since then, they've not been anywhere near as good, in my opinion. They've had some good songs on those albums, but... There's a gradual decline, in my opinion, in the quality of their music with a couple of high points here and there. But if you say that in any of their fan communities, you get roasted. (laughs) How dare you speak badly of Justin (laughs) Hawkins? Uh, This is why what we do is so important because it gives other fans that watch what we do license to be honest in the community Mm. and real. Absolutely. 